Hello and welcome to a new episode of the AST Podcast. Our guests today are Dave Sinnes, an Assistant Professor of Practical Theology here at AST, and Tom Bodoin, who's an Associate Professor of Practical Theology at Fordham University in New York. Dave and Tom have both been conducting research into the relationship between the religious and the secular, how this relationship is played out in relation to spaces, in relation to buildings, in relation to public performances. They explore questions about what it means to be spiritual or even religious in the 21st century. And they explore questions about the relationship between secularity, spirituality, religiosity and more. It's a fascinating conversation that I learned an awful lot from, and I hope you enjoy it. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Over the past um, 15, 20 years or so, um, you have been exploring um, the, the ends of Christendom and the forms of religious expression which emerge in that, in that space. It's far too broad a question simply to ask you to tell us about your research. Um, But while while aware that it is an impossible question, what can you tell us or what would you like to share with our audience about the kind of work you've been doing um, over the past over the past few years on this topic? Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be with you both on this podcast Um, and uh, Let me just say that uh, this topic is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. So what happens with a heritage that is rich and complicated and ambiguous uh, and that used to be in control uh, and that used to claim dominance uh, in a particular space or culture or geography and no longer does? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then what happens to the... um, Uh, the expressions of what we might call spirituality, religiosity, uh, and its counterpart, secularity, uh, secularisms, uh, in this changing environment. And that question has preoccupied me for a long time. And uh, one way that I'm trying to approach that question now is by studying the Pantheon in Rome. Because uh, the Pantheon is a... um, originally a Roman temple that was built in the early second century of the Common Era. And uh, it served as a temple for a few hundred years, uh, then fell into disuse uh, as the empire became officially Christian, uh, and then uh, became a Catholic church, a Roman Catholic church in 608-609. And then from that time has continued to operate as a Roman Catholic church right up until today, a basilica as a matter of of fact. Um, And why is the Pantheon interesting to me? Uh, And what am I doing there? I'll just talk about that briefly. It's interesting to me because uh, the Pantheon is a a church we can look to where it's, uh, it's the complexities of its past and its present are Mm self-evident, at least to a theologian, at least to me. Uh, The complexities of the past are self-evident in the sense that its quote-unquote pagan uh, character still shows through so clearly uh, in the architecture, in the design of the space, in the, in the, in the body's um, uh, uh, way of operating in the space, uh, in the way that light works, um, in so much of the space, you can see the original theological presumptions from the second century still at work in the space. And I'm curious about how the Roman Catholic Church and the Pantheon as a Catholic Church deals with that quote unquote pagan past. How do you manage that? Um, and how do you um, kind of resignify that in the process of becoming a church, even though that quote-unquote paganness is still present in a way. Mm -hmm. So there's that, there's kind of the looking back aspect of the complex heritage. In other words, there's the difference within the tradition that's already there. There's the otherness within the tradition that's already there that has to be somehow managed and is still available to be noticed and experienced. Uh, And then in the present, and by the way, all churches have this. I would think all religious institutions have this, but all churches have this difference within, within the heritage, this otherness within the heritage that has to be managed 
somehow, for better or for worse. Uh, and then in the present, the Pantheon as a Catholic church uh, is uh, has mass. Uh, mass is celebrated twice a week, sometimes more. Um, there is a community there, but it is a tiny community. Uh, and it is um, symbolic. Uh, let me say a little bit more about that community. The, the Pantheon also welcomes millions of visitors a year, millions who come into that space, and many of whom end up going to, to Mass or, or uh, being very interested in the Catholic elements of the space, uh, but many of whom uh, are not Catholic and are not Christian, uh, but they are in this space, they feel something special in this space, something significant in this space, they want to be in this space, they want to experience this space. So in that sense, now talking about the present and the multi-religious and the multi-non-religious present of the Pantheon, it's a church that doesn't control its own population. Mm -hmm. And it's in, way, in some ways, it's a church that doesn't even know its own visitors. And in that way, it's quite similar to the predicament of the Western church, uh, where uh, uh, the church's people are not anymore under their, let's say, control. <laughs> Uh, people come in and out, and people from different traditions come in and out. Um, that doesn't mean you have no one anymore who stays and dwells, but there's a lot more movement than there used to be across and in and out. And so um, the way that the ministers in the Pantheon today, there's a whole Catholic staff in the Pantheon, the way that they understand and relate to that difference in the present and that otherness in the present is also very compelling to me and then puts it in line with the situation of a whole lot of established Western churches and their challenges. So that's the work I'm doing today is to really investigate the, the difference in the otherness of the past in this church and the difference in the otherness in the present and how that relates to what it means for that to be a church. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I am... Uh, spending a lot of time there doing observation of the space and not only learning about the architectural history over the last 1900 years, the changes that have been made and why they, those changes have been made, but also um, how people use the space today, how people, what, what people choose to do when they go into the space, how they spend time, what questions they ask, what guides they use to get around in the space. Uh, and then also what the staff imagines, that their task is in this space? What's their mission in this space? So I'm spending a lot of time talking to uh, staff and ministers as well. So to me, it's an extraordinarily rich environment, uh, very much speaking to the present, but also speaking to the antiquity of the Catholic Church, the Christian yeah. Church, mm -hmm. connecting us way, way back. So to me, it's all one piece. Um, yeah. And let, let me pause there. No, that's that's really fascinating. Um, I over the past few days I've been reading um, Pope Francis's papal exhortation on on Amazonia, and um, it's it's really really interesting. I know in the past you've done some work on on Tom Groom, but there were sections which were like Tom Groom <laughs> like had written. Um, he has Francis has no time whatsoever for the. Um, for the idea that there is a monolithic form of, of Catholicism which needs to be superimposed on every every alternative space and, um, and and flags the idea that all forms of Catholicism are are are, are, are fundamentally syncretistic um, and um, I think conservatives were so pleased about what Francis didn't say about the ordination of 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 of, of, of married clergy, um, that they missed the true radicalism mm. in the exhortation. At one mm. stage, Francis is speaking about the presence of Christ. He says, "Christ is present in the in the in, in, in the water, in the rivers, in the in, in, in the fields, in the trees." And he talks about various. Um, he speaks disparagingly about people speaking about pagan symbols. <laughs> you know, <laughs> as if there's not always a constant a constant dialogue. Um, Dave, you have looked and 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 um, one of the really interesting things about Tom's research is the is the is the practical 
focus that in this case um, the Pantheon is it, like is providing for these questions that's mm -hmm. something that you've looked at uh, over the past um, six months or, or a year yeah absolutely um, so I was lucky enough to have a, a six months uh, sabbatical for some research and I spent the time um, in uh, based in France uh, but traveling to some other parts of, of Europe and to, and to Israel um, because I became, uh, when I was on holidays uh, a few years ago, I became really fascinated by these sound and light shows that really have taken off as this French phenomenon. Um, so they started in, in the middle of the 20th century, and now there are upwards of 50 or 60 a year just in France alone. Plus, they've taken off um, to other parts of the world. There was one in, in Texas. There's one inside the... Uh, the Basilica in Montreal, um, and, and they're sometimes part of these digital light art festivals. But essentially what they are are these shows that use digital uh, media to project um, sa visuals and, and combine that with sound effects and music um, in really an entertaining show um, that is projected onto the front of uh, historic religious buildings, so cathedrals, and abbeys and things like that. So I traveled around and saw about 20 of these and did research at uh, just about uh, a dozen of them because I became really fascinated about the juxtaposition of visiting some of these um, just spectacular medieval flamboyant Gothic cathedrals that had very few people inside, especially very few people inside to go to, to actually go to Mass. And then had people sitting in the rain an hour early to get the best seat to watch these free shows mm -hmm. outside of the church. Now the interesting thing is, um, at least in the French, in the French context, um, these cathedrals and abbeys, for the most part, are actually owned by the state. So the state takes care of the building, and the church is charged with the kind of the spiritual life of the building. Uh, and what happens in the building. So this isn't the churches themselves that are putting them on. Uh, and actually when I interviewed uh, bishops and priests at some of these different churches, um, none of them had ever really been consulted about mm. uh, what the show that year will be or what's involved. And yet, because of the deep love of, um, of history among the uh, among the French and uh, and other Europeans as well, there inevitably is this mixture of kind of the spiritual religious history yeah, yeah, yeah. of the building. So, for example, in Orléans, there's a show that's all about Joan of Arc, and there are scenes of a, a young girl, you know, who's Joan, walking across the balconies in the on the front of the cathedral, hearing the voices of St. Michael and St. Catherine of Siena call her. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, this story of deep religious call that is played out in a very public way. So I became really interested because I think as Canadians, we are very, I feel like we, we, we're, we do a couple different things with our current uh, growing polarization, right? We're in this context where, not unlike other parts of the West, um, there's a gro there's a, a growing shift of people to either choose um, kind of a high religiosity or a no religiosity, even though there's still this huge low religious middle. Um, and the recent research from the past few years actually indicates that as much as we Canadians are kind of used to going down to the states and mm -hmm. grabbing resources from there and figuring out how to use them in our own context, in terms of uh, in terms of attendance and participation and the the salience of religion in people's lives, the research shows we are actually closer to Western Europe, to France and Spain and the UK, um, rather than to the states. Uh, so I wanted to see, you know, if if there is this growing polarization and if there's this secularization or secularizations that have happened. Um, in the UK, or, or sorry, in Europe, then how are these light shows actually contributing to the religious and spiritual lives of the broader public who are going? Right. So I traveled to uh, a number of, sh of shows and, and 
uh, asked people to fill in questionnaires and did on-the-spot interviews and follow-up interviews with people who, who left their contact information um, to get a sense of how was, was their experience of these shows uh, something uh, that was caught up and, and kind of intermingling with their religious and spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Th there's, from the perspective of, a, of, of someone who is largely clueless about these topics, um, but is a committed Christian, there is a sort of a, a disconcerting element and also a, a hopeful element. Um, and these may represent the poles, and, 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 and Tom, you, know, you can you know, speak to this, and it could be that I'm completely off base. But on the one hand, as a Christian, I'm a little bit sad that um, that Christianity is becoming the classics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, one more object of study from or past. And in the same way that moderns, we were fascinated by the, the Greek and Roman past. and mm -hmm. We poked it with a stick and, 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 and visited it. Um, so too that the Christianity is, is becoming this. On the other hand, um, part of me is thinking, is the kind of research that Tom and Dave are, are, are doing, is that exploring the idea that, you know, the old Augustinian mantra that our heart will only rest when it rests in God, and therefore a, a supposedly arid secular context is actually radically dissatisfying to people who are searching and are searching these places um, and these and, and, and these symbols for something. And so that's a sort of a, a hopeful, mm -hmm. that, that, that's the hopeful voice in me. And then the, the, the sad voice in me is wondering on the other side. Tom, um, are either of these um, or, or both of these um, in any way um, resonant with, with the kind of research you're doing? Or, or, or does your research um, speak to either of these poles? Uh, I think that is a really uh, subtly phrased question and uh, very perceptive, and, and I, I'm glad you raised it. And let me just say that, uh, uh, Dave, I really appreciated hearing about your research there, that synopsis of it. It is so fascinating. Thanks. And you've chosen such, a, such an interesting, and in a way, pe maybe people would not assume that that would be a place of theological discovery. Mm -hmm. but, but I think I agree with you, it is. Uh, and so I just want to just, I don't know, commend you and uh, affirm that that is like really, really interesting, important research. And, and we need more theologians who are willing to step out into these new spaces mm -hmm. where people actually gather uh, and that have some, you know, you, you make the, you said uh, they're watching a show outside the church. I love that phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's a connection to the ecclesial, if you will. Uh, but it bears little resemblance to what we tend to assume today. Right. Although, historically, it bears a lot of resemblance uh, to how people related to the church. Uh, if you read Charles Taylor's Secular Age, for example, mm -hmm. uh, most of that uh, medieval Christianity is not ecclesial in the sense that we think of it today. It's not taking place within the doors of the church. Uh, it's taking place, as you say, at the show outside the church. <laughs> um, so, uh, but let me come to um, Dave's good questions about um, this research. First of all, on sadness, and I, I appreciate your honesty about the sadness of this situation for many people, of a post-secular situation, um, of, a, of, the, of the end of, uh, let's say, Christian predominance in many places. I think your note of sadness has not been well enough appreciated. And I, I would count myself among those who have not taken that seriously enough in my research, um, because for different reasons, I have been more ready to speed right to the exciting parts of the post-secular uh, environment and, and have been doing that for 25 years, but I have not I think register the sadness uh, that is also there. And uh, this started to come home to me when I did what's called deconversion research several years ago, mm -hmm. uh, where um, with a colleague here at Fordham, uh, Professor Patrick Kornbeck, who's a church historian, we interviewed people who were leaving or had left the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, 
And one thing I learned through that project is how much grieving there is uh, for those who leave and also for their families. Um, mm -hmm. This is not a clean, painless, uncomplicated shift that's mm -hmm. going on. And so uh, even as things turn, there is, for those for whom ecclesiality meant something, uh, there is something to grieve. Uh, and for the, for the parents of kids who are no longer connected uh, to the church, there is something to grieve. And I don't think we've ha talked about that grieving enough and worked creatively uh, to, to honor that grieving and to talk about what it means. So I, I think there's something very serious there, and I'm glad that you've raised it. Um, now, in terms of the, the aridity uh, of the secular, uh, the, the dryness, you know, the, that's the metaphorics you were going to, um, and the, the, the maybe our research, or at least my research, is a way of um, finding what's hopeful in that. Uh, that's, again, a very thoughtful point. The way I would put it is, I don't see the post-secular uh, as necessarily uh, an arid or a dry, brittle, and unsatisfying space. Um, and I, I say this as someone who is, tries to be qualitatively attuned, empirically attuned as a practical theologian, and listening to accounts of people's lives where um, there are um, satisfactions and meaningful lives to be made apart from religious affiliation or even it, with uh, moderate to low religious affiliation. So the move toward uh, being none or having no religious affiliation or the very common Roman Catholic situation of being low affiliated uh, does not to me uh, equate to um, a thinness about life. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is actually, instead of starting with um, a theory about religious versus secular, I'm starting to ask what are people like uh, and how are people living uh, and what do people need and how do they make their way? And so, in other words, uh, to, to build an understanding of what might be religious or spiritual or secular from the ground up instead of from the top down. So that's why I take the approach that I do. I mean, I learn from theories of religion, spirituality, and secularity, of course. But uh, I would rather start from lived experience. That doesn't mean there are no um, ambiguities and violences about secular culture, to be sure. Um, uh, war, uh, uh, consumer capitalism, um, homophobia, racism, uh, none of these have been solved by turns to post-secularism. So it's not as if there are no problems, uh, no tasks and no liberations to which we ought to commit ourselves. Uh, but I would rather start with an understanding of how people experience their own lives and what they need uh, instead of um, going from the top down with theories of secularity or religion. Mm -hmm. And is that is that similar to the approach that you take, Dave? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. Uh, and, and thanks, Tom, for what you were saying. Um, when I was getting ready for the for to, to go and do the, the field research um, and, and while I was there, some people I, I'd meet people uh, because I interviewed people who in some contexts were, you know, there were some smaller cities that are known more for their, you know, tourists from the UK, from France, from Switzerland, but then others like at Mont Saint-Michel, you get people who descend on that place as a, as really a place of, of um, pilgrimage for a lot of people. Um, so you get people from all over the world. And some people were saying, you know, um, are you saying that then, you know, churches I distinctly remember some people from Canada and the U.S. saying, so are you saying that our churches should, should do these kind of shows? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, this is not research in order to replicate. I don't actually necessarily know that, uh, and, and I'm still early in my analysis, um, but 
I can't say for sure that these are actually um, methods that these shows, uh, yes, they positively contribute to some people's lives, but not to the point where I would say, yeah, this is a great practice and we, you know, it, it becomes a, a spiritual practice we should replicate. Mm -hmm. What it does let me know, however, is what matters to people in their spiritual lives. Because in asking them how these shows connect with them, um, I get these subtle undertones that actually say more about what matters to them spiritually and religiously um, based on the how they are interacting with the show and the things that they are highlighting in speaking with me about the show. Because it's not really the shows themselves I'm researching at all. It's the experience of this diverse group of people mm -hmm. who... Um, some of whom engage in the show as a spectator mm -hmm. and some of whom go to the show as spectators and leave with something, leave that, you know, something has happened. I remember interviewing someone or getting a response from, from, uh, to a response to my questionnaire, uh, from someone who watched a show about the life of King David at King David's Citadel in Israel. So it's a paid show. It's one of the few that happen inside, um, in, inside a space. You buy a ticket, you go, you sit down, um, and this, these projected images appear all over the walls. Um, and this person admitted they have very low religiosity, grew up with some, some sort of connection nominal connection to the church but don't practice and have never really practiced as an adult mm -hmm. and yet there was something about the combination of the people and the space and the show that prompted this person to leave and want to engage in the biblical stories not just the story of king david but the the other biblical stories um to get a sense of of what is actually going on and and what are these stories? So is this a conversion experience in, you know, the way we normally say it is? No. Is this a great, you know, lightning bolt from heaven and the skies open and God becomes revealed in a unique way? No. But something happened to that person and the way that they speak about it indicates that even that person was surprised that this was their response to something that they just thought they were going to come and watch like a movie. Mm -hmm. So there's something going on. There are a lot, many things going on for many different people. And at this point, though, um, the res you know, the, my analysis is showing that the patterns are very difficult to perceive. Um, some people who are part of the church interact with it as a spiritual religious experience. Other people find it to be mere entertainment because it's not part of the established religion, mm -hmm. the established institutional practices. Um, but for others who who are not part of the church, it it for some is a gateway to some sort of deeper awareness or sensibility to something that is beyond themselves. Um, whether it is the the act of doing something communally, because that's that was something else that kind of came out that surprised me, is it wasn't necessarily the show itself, but it was the fact that people were in a community doing this together. Um, that really challenged also my hello and welcome to part two of our podcast um dave you were uh, making an interesting point there you had spoken a little bit about how the um the experience of of of, of, of king david has you know raised a, a hunger to know more and how this serves the gateway but then for other people it's an entirely different kind of experience mm -hmm. yeah um absolutely and and there really is as Right now, my my analysis has not um, picked out any sort of pattern or obvious um, set of variables that I, that can be isolated to you know to determine who interacts with the show in particular ways. Um, but there are elements that surprised me, and one thing is the communal nature of the show. That there are people who were saying there's something about being here outside under the stars in a beautiful space with a whole group of people engaged in the same experience and i think that really counters the both both 
within the church and, and outside of the church, it counters this individual way that we have seen, uh, that we have perceived faith, mm-hmm. that we have perceived um, spirituality, that yeah. there was, it was about the deep connections, the, the relationship, even though people never spoke to each other. Yeah. There was something about experiencing the show together that um, was really quite stunning to see people um, talk about gotcha. in our age where we are marketed as individuals both mm-hmm. and that's something in the church as well right mm-hmm. I, I, I keep um, up until now a lot of my research has been on youth and, and children mm-hmm. and there's this sense of um, you know the, the, this whole I, a lot of people talk about the idea of belong believe behave mm-hmm. and we essentially disagree uh, people disagree about the order at which those right. things right. happen um, but even when we speak about that, we're talking about individuals. How does an individual, do they believe and then belong and then behave? Or do they belong and then believe and then behave and mm-hmm. all that stuff? But the, the thing is, when we're focused on the individuals, we miss the sense, uh, the, the communal nature of spiritual experience, of right. religiosity right. that this highlighted. Absolutely. Um, Tom, so much of your research um, seems to resist easy binaries. One of the one of the pathologies of starting exclusively with theory is that things can fit into binary between sacred and profane, between secular and religious, between church and non-church. Um, but when methodologically you work with um, lived experience and, 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 and work up from that, um, you know, you've been able to call into question and, and, and begin to deconstruct those binaries. Um, and of course, one of the binaries is between the, um, the, the clearly delineated religious or ecclesial space and then the, the, the outside, you know, where, like, like where Dave was, was, was speaking about, um, you know, people witnessing the public performance and you were saying that, well, you know, this is like, like the medieval religious culture. This was this was far more typical mm-hmm. than the, than the alternative. Could you speak a little bit about that? Because I think, like myself, many of our our listeners and viewers will be will be tempted to think in those clearly delineated binaries that you're that you're resisting. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question. I, the longer I do this work the more I realize how how fluid and porous um, these terms are on which we have staked so Mm -hmm. much uh, in Christian theology and theological studies. um, And terms like religious, terms like spiritual, terms like church, um, even terms like secular, every time that these are terms that we must use if we're to work theologically or I don't know if we if we must use them. There are terms that that we have a hard time avoiding using, mm-hmm. uh, and when we when we use them, though, every time we delineate uh, some a central term like that, we create an outside, right? So we say there's that there's there are insiders to this term. There are things that happen in this, and then there's the rest, uh, and so. What I want to say is, to put it in very simple terms, is to help us take responsibility for our exclusions. Mm. So every time that we make a term that matters to us theologically, even such a basic term as uh, Christian, something like that, then there's necessarily the the non-Christian imagination that's built into that, okay? What's outside that circle? And so before, when one is going to work with terms that matter to somebody in this, uh, it's really important to think through the exclusions that make that term possible. Who do we think the other is that doesn't fit here? And why do we think of them that way? And the further we go along, especially in post-colonial, decolonially minded research, we realize that that Bringing those exclusions on board is a really important part of this work. So um, it's that that gets to your point about getting out of a binary, mm-hmm. right? So um, even you know, well, let me say it this way: um, 
and maybe I'd love to hear Dave's thought on this too, because we think about practices a lot, Dave mm-hmm. and I. And uh, uh, when you think about practices, as you said, David, that that gets if, if you study practices well, you should get out of binary thinking. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, and because you get into the rich, complicated, uh, non-binary experience of lived of life as it's lived, uh, and in in which everyone is in relationship to what is thought of as other or what is thought of as different inside and outside. Um, So when we talk about practices, um, we're always talking about ways that people handle um, a complicated past in front of a novel present, right? So, when we, we study practices, we're always studying practices because there's a new situation, like these sound and light shows. There's a new situation that calls up something new out of a complicated past that you have to somehow manage. Mm-hmm. What that means is to be human and to, to be constituted by our practices as humans is we are people who are always changing and who are always renegotiating that inside and outside. right? So what that means is, to take it all the way back to your opening question, uh, is that what it means to be religious, quote unquote, or what it means to be spiritual, or what it means to be Christian, or take your center of gravity, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. is necessarily in process. It is necessarily unfinished because we always encounter situations we have never encountered before. Mm -hmm. And so we always have to ask anew, what does it mean to be whatever this central term is, religious, spiritual, Christian, secular, whatever. What does it mean to be that now? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be that now? Which is why, for example, I love um, Edward Skillebex, a Dutch theologian, uh, a book he wrote on Christology several decades ago was subtitled uh, An Experiment in Christology. So there's an experimental character to all theology. And that can be scary because sometimes uh, we are raised to believe that to be religious or spiritual is to already have all the important questions answered. Uh, But we have to have the courage to take responsibility for our exclusions and to open up to the experimental character uh, of what we are about, even in terms of what matters most. That doesn't mean we give up our center of gravity, but it means that we accept ourselves as open uh, and relational in a strong sense uh, and should always uh, remain curious about what we're becoming. I know that got a little philosophical. No, but great. Just, That's wonderful. Just, yeah, and, I, and I, I'd love okay. to hear how, how, how Dave, what, David, mm-hmm. what do you think of that and how Dave deals with those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, so brilliantly put, Tom. Um, and, and it really helps me frame some of um, some of what I found through my field research because the the there both uh, you know it, it was really uh, I, I call it kind of like um, guerrilla qualitative research because the nature of the shifting show like the way the shows were different the way the people interacted with them in a non-research way required so many different methods um, for, and for me to adapt on the spot. Uh, and one of the things that I tried to do is use a, a mixed method approach where there are some open-ended questions and a few closed-ended kind of demographic questions like, do you consider yourself um, religious, spiritual, both, neither, how important are religion, spirituality, and things like that? Um, and it was, it was exactly like a a textbook case of, of what you're saying here. Um, and the loaded nature of some of these terms that we have understood in these binary, if, if you are Christian, then you, there are others who are not Christian. If you are spiritual, the others who are not, who are not spiritual. Um, and people had very different strong reactions uh, to the point that there are some people who were really uncomfortable with the term spirituality because of in their association with that term 
their it spoke to them of kind of a cultish quality people who who emerge as charismatic leaders prey upon people's spiritual needs <clears throat> excuse me and then um, really do a lot of destructive work mm-hmm. in people's lives and so they really resisted um, the idea of spirituality others really were harmed by and walked away from the church um, and and so were resistant to those ideas of, of Christianity and of, of organized religion. Yet, even among those who, who said, you know, there's nothing spiritual going on here, or nothing religious going on here, when I actually talked to them about their experiences, there was deep theological meaning that was being generated by what they were experiencing and what they were then processing through me. Because that was something else that was really interesting that spoke to me about and and this kind of goes back to what i was saying earlier about how people um asked me so what do we do as a church then do we just do shows like this to get people in what i found is that for some of these people it was the act of speaking about the show in this way that allowed them to begin to interpret theologically religiously spiritually an experience that they expected to be more akin to going to the theater or going to the movies. Um, And it was one, I remember one priest I interviewed uh, spoke to me about this, about how as a priest at a a former cathedral that gets a ton of tourists because of the space and the the, the historical nature of the building and and it's the town that it's in, um, he said, you know, my job is not to get them into the church, but to help them see the religious and spiritual, like the, see the theology in the everyday life, which is very much close to my heart as a practical theologian. I know close to yours as well, Tom. Um, and this to me was one thing that happened in, in those interview moments is that suddenly the, 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 the terms didn't matter so much because there was something else that was going on there in a very real, in-the-moment, experiential, lived way. Um, And that, I think, is what, to me, it opens up to the possibilities for the church. Um, it, It highlights, to me, the possibilities of moving away from this sense of offering, you know, better programs or trying to do something else to get people to come into the space but to go out to the spaces where people are living their everyday religious and spiritual lives, even without using those terms, and helping to engage them in, not, not in things that we're imposing upon them, but in a deeper way, helping them make sense of their own meaning and their own realities. I mean, that's what the research shows um, in that, you know, even though people, more people are saying no to regular participation and attendance in church, the big questions that religion used to be the default answer to in the Western world, those questions are still being asked, but not a lot has come in to really uh, offer substantive responses to those questions. The people, people are still searching. We as a society are still searching people, yet the 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 walls of the church are now opened and the search is all over the place um, and that allows us to join people where they are in their own quests for meaning and value and um, sensibility about the realities of of life right right um I'm, I'm fascinated by and so this could come across wrong here um, it's a great setup. <laughs> Tom, Tom has, 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 has spoken about the post-secular. Um, and I am fully convinced by both you, you and Tom's um, rejection of easily lines of delineation. Um, part of me, however, is a little bit wonders if the... The Parthenon is a product of of an imagination which sees uh, 
the the temporal and the eternal related. Um, Christianity is is a is, is a discourse which I think sees the temporal and the eternal related. There are a number of thinkers. I'm thinking about Richard Dawkins. I'm thinking about mm-hmm. Sam Harris. I'm thinking about um, a veritable army of men in their 20s and 30s on YouTube, <laughs> you know, for whom all this form of thinking and even this questioning of the of the of the relevance of this to something else mm-hmm. is the product of a of an infantile mind. Now again, I'm with Taylor and Berger and not all those others who said, you know, this whole secularization thesis, you know, we've got to we've got to move beyond that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time there's an awful lot of these people. Um, and, and, and so while I really like what Tom and you are saying about this is as always been the case, that people are um, you know, relating questions of meaning and practicality in a very lived way, and that this links the you know, pre-Christian Celtic religions in Ireland via St. Bridget towards, you know, and, and we see what's happening with the Parthenon and we see what's happening in, 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 in Augustine's North Africa. I wonder whether the modern Western European secular project in its Dawkinsian iteration does not represent a break with this, mm-hmm. you know? So are we... What would you say to someone who says, Tom, Dave, um, you are too quick to speak about the post-secular. Um, it will take us a long time. You know, I've just finished reading Tom Holland's book, Dominion. It will take us a long time to shake off the shackles of um, religious, metaphysical, Christian culture, but we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in time, we can look on these things as the as the products of a of a deluded mind, which they were. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say to this, to these... Th- th- these kind of voices that we that we encounter in the new atheist movement, Tom. <laughs> yeah, that's a really complicated question. Uh, you you put a lot on the table there in a short time. Let me just see if I can respond in a brief way and see then what you think about that. Um, first of all, and most importantly, I don't want to get. I don't see the most important matter here as a back and forth about whether God exists. Uh, I I just don't see that as the most promising avenue Mm -hmm. for getting to how people actually live. Um, So the the new atheism, uh, I I think on the one hand, uh, those arguments in those books and those authors to me, they are arguing with a notion of God that some people have uh, and that I'm sure many people are still taught, but there are a lot of people who don't have that notion of God. Um, and so they're, you know, so what they're taking apart uh, is, is not everybody's God. Uh, but uh on the other hand, so maybe I'd be critical in that way. On the other hand, uh, it's not only about intellectual debate uh, about God. It's these arguments about God are coming up because of a deep dissatisfaction with what's been inherited uh, religiously. Mm-hmm. And so there's another way that these things are coming from people's bodies and lived experiences, frustrations, angers, um, and that has to be met as well. So the, there's a whole substrate uh, that to, to this, let's say, conversation. It's not really conversation, but there's a whole substrate to this dilemma about what to do about the Christian heritage in Western culture that has to get below the level of arguments about God's existence. Um, it has to do with, with griefs and grievances, you know, to go back to an earlier point, um, and so we have to be talking about more what kind of world we want uh, and how do we live in it together, knowing that no one will ever finally agree on God. It's just the case. And I think um, even, 
a, a theist or an atheist or an agnostic, I would say, will have to come to terms with that. There will be no final consensus. So in a world where there is no final consensus, how do we live together? That to me is more pressing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in a way more engageable then who's going to win and who's going to lose in a debate about God's existence? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it, To me, it's... I don't think people like Harris, Dawkins, um, I don't think they represent any sort of majority of people. I think that there are elements in what they are saying very loudly that um, people might have some level of agreement with. But I think for the most part, um, even, you know, you can take highly post-Christian contexts in Western Europe and, or, or you can take Quebec in North America as, as an example, um, where levels of attendance and participation and kind of what have been the classic sociological markers of religious salience and religiosity mm -hmm have plummeted, yet identification and belief are still quite high. Mm. Um, so I think both the both voices um, in the debate, and, and uh, you know, I really appreciate what you're saying about this, Tom, um, are both very loud voices, and it's almost like we have a whole bunch of people lined up at a bar, and the two people at the end of the bar are yelling back and forth and arguing, and everyone in the middle is just really uncomfortable and doesn't want to have anything to do with either of them. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think the majority of these post, or a lot of people in these post-Christian contexts are living. They are not as, you know, they're not anti-religion um, in the way that some of these voices would be, but they are not... Um, anti-anti-religion in the way other voices are. Right. Um, so, and, and that is, I think, a space that we fail to look at because the two poles are just so loud. Right. Yeah. So uh, let, let's take Ricky Gervais, right? right? Um, what I'm hearing you say, and I'm very much enthused and encouraged, yeah. that when we look at certain spaces we're seeing uh, a perennial human engagement with questions of meaning, which takes a plurality of different forms in different in different spaces, and we need to be attuned to that, and we need to read it, we need to learn from that, and we need to and we need to explore that. Um, Ricky Gervais would say that this building, this space, um, was originally devoted to a whole host of um, of gods that mm -hmm. over time. Um, were traded in for a Christian singular, but also not quite singular God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but now, um, Ricky Gervais says the 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 philosophically literate line: "I don't believe in God. I believe in science." And so, all these attempts to question meaning with reference to the to the something else, they're products of a period in history. And Nietzsche, in a much more subtle way, like 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 might also agree with that. That and that and that this period of of history is is ending. Um, it seems to me, and I know that both of you are are, are loath to to take sides, but it seems to me that, that both of you are saying no, Ricky Gervais, that's wrong. To be human is to ask these questions, mm -hmm. and from studying how humans have responded to that and how the, uh, we've evolved in relation to these questions, we can learn an awful lot, and it's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. Is that is that fair, Tom, Dave? Dave, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you want to take this one first? Well, sure, and and I'll rely on the, the some of the research that um, that Andy Root has been doing. Uh, into specifically around youth ministry and science um, is really fascinating because he, and he's not the first to do this, but he, he, he does it really well where he, he essentially speaks of science in and of itself as inherently religious. There are lived practices and assumptions and values that are very much ascribed to among the scientific community that in and of themselves are quite religious in nature. They they might reject the content of Christian belief, mm 
and Christian faith, but the actual processes, what's happening underneath all of them, is not dissimilar from what happens to those people who say, I don't believe in science, I believe in, mm -hmm. in, in religion. Um, so I think it's, it's much more complicated right. uh -huh. um, in a sense because on the surface we are highlighting what is dissimilar and what is distinct, yet underneath there's a lot more shared reality. Right. Yeah. Right. Tom, Ricky Gervais, right or wrong? I don't know uh, this line of uh, Ricky Gervais's <laughs> that you're talking about, but I, I mean, it, but I heard uh, how you described it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know quite know what to say about it because I, I guess what I would say is whether one opts for science. And you always have to, as Dave is saying, you always have to ask, well, what does one mean by science? Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether one opts for science or one opts for religion or, or, or some other way of holding life together, uh, these, these things that, let, let's, let's take him at his word, Ricky Gervais, and that science is very motivating for how he lives and, and um and how he votes and spends his money and, and, and advocates politically, et cetera. And that for someone else, when someone else says they're religious, that they take it with equal seriousness. Mm -hmm. What matters there is the publicness of those commitments. Uh, so that these are not, so what I, I appreciate this in particular about your point about uh, Ricky Gervais, that these commitments that we have have a public significance. Mm -hmm. So um, there's no such thing as private belief. Uh, and uh, in a world where we all deserve access to the goods of life, right? what we take to matter most is going to inform how we vote, how we spend our money, who we spend time with, what we advocate for, uh, where we place our bodies. So um, I think that, uh, again, I hate to do this, but I want to get away from a dichotomy of science against mm -hmm. something else and say, I would rather look at if someone is saying, I only believe in science and nothing else. And if another person is saying, I only believe in religion and nothing else, I'm not activated by that dichotomy mm -hmm. immediately. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in what's the, what's the public significance of what you're telling me? What does that mean in terms of um, voting, advocacy, and ultimately access to the goods of life. Mm -hmm. right? What's that mean? So people can actually take two conceptually seemingly opposed stances uh, that sometimes fall out as religion versus science, but might overlap quite strongly on what that actually means or how they live their life, what they do with their life, what they how they relate to their family, their community, their country, their globe, their universe, uh, and what they advocate for. That to me is actually the deeper issue. Again, mm -hmm. I don't want to be caught up in who's right and who's wrong about this and that because there will be no consensus. Wonderful stuff. Tom and Dave, could we conclude um, just by putting on the radar of the people watching and listening um, when they can expect to be able to um, to be able to benefit from the kind of research you're doing, Tom. At what stage is your is, is your Parthenon project? Uh, well, just it's Pantheon. Oh, the Parthenon. Parthenon's a different, right. Yeah, the Parthenon's a different building, but the, yes. the uh, Pantheon work is uh, in process. So uh, this year, uh, this is the year 2020. This year, I'm going to hopefully be starting a visitor survey in the Pantheon right. to learn from visitors about their own experience. And uh, that's a very important part of the work as well. So that we need to get through the visitor survey before I can really start saying anything substantive right. about this. Um, but I'm, I'm reporting bits and pieces in some presentations I'm giving, but it won't come out in publications for at least another few years. And if you wanted to direct our audience to some of your existing work, which maybe flags on some of those issues. Where would they? Where would they look? I can link them. I can link them below. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great question. Well, um, I would start with um, something 
two things that I've just written that mm-hmm. your uh, listeners might find particularly interesting. One is on secular Catholicism, yeah. uh, and it is uh, an entry for um, uh, an encyclopedia that is just about to be published. Uh, and it's a, a long essay entry that talks about uh, secular Catholicism. Uh, right. What are its characteristics and why is it important? Um, by secular Catholicism, I mean people who have some Catholic identification but are not interested or able to practice mm-hmm. uh, in, a, in what might be considered a normative way. Um, and then I've written another chapter that's about to come out in a book uh, about secular Catholic family life. Uh, and um, some of the complexities involved in that. So I think that would take people right into what I'm thinking about and also take them right into their own lives uh, to ask these questions as well. Wonderful. So I, I'll give you the links to those. Thank you so much. I'll make sure that they're, um, that they're linked below on YouTube. Um, Dave, is it fair to say, and I could be wrong on this, but that this project... It's, it's consistent with your existing work, mm-hmm. but it also is quite distinct in terms of, in, in terms of core theme. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So up until now, my, my work has been focused on um, theology and faith as it relates to youth and children. Um, and that has evolved so that essentially the children and youth became not a topic or a subset of my theological thinking, but as a gateway to the broader um, whole experiment and and practice of theology. Um, I tend to be someone who looks to the lived practices of everyday life and looks for how theology bursts forth and grows out of that. Um, And so that has kind of been my gateway into theology. And one of the practical uh, realities that is challenging established ecclesial structures is the loss of young people to the church yeah. and how young people in a, in a lot of ways have been commodified um, as the hope of the institutional church because we don't have them <laughs> so if we don't get them we're going to die um, So, you know, to simplify it, we want young people in the church, but we want them in the church our way. We don't want them to actually change what church is. Um, And in a way, this research departs from that. But as you said, it kind of Mm -hmm. evolves out of that because this is now looking at those people who are outside of the church um, or, or at least a practice that is happening uh, more on the fringes of church. I love how Kenda Dean talks about youth ministry as a research and development arm of the church. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where, where I stand, right, yeah, is, that is really how well the revolution this, yeah. goes from the outside in, not the yeah. inside out. Um, so I haven't, you know, we are very early to have this conversation. And, you know, as I've said, the analysis is early. That I have not written a lot about it. I just got back uh, two months ago from this. Yeah. Um but what I would direct listeners to are uh, Tom's work that, that he has already mentioned, um, because I, I think there's a lot in there that is not only related to your work, Tom, but, but it also very much related to the, the conversation we've had about both of our projects. So yeah. Wonderful. Tom, Dave, thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed and learned a lot from this conversation. Thanks. And thank you so much for giving us your time. This has been a delight. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.